Thanks for joining us for today's message. We encourage you to visit southernhillslv.com to watch or listen to past messages. We hope you enjoy today's message from God's Word. First Corinthians chapter number four uh, today begins this brand new sermon series. The sermon series is entitled, Don't Buy What They're Selling. Don't buy what they're selling. Redefining what the world calls leadership. I'm really excited for the ladies of this church because there's a ladies conference coming up in just two and a half weeks right here. And you can uh, register for that. It's called the Inspired Ladies Conference. It's taking place right here in this auditorium. We want you to come. All you have to do is pick up tickets in the foyer on the way out. And men, two weeks after that, so only about a month away, is our men's retreat. And it's taking place in Utah this year. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's only overnight, a 24-hour retreat with men. And Pastor Chris is going to be there. I'm going to be there. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope you can be there as well. Redefining what the world calls leadership. The first sermon today can be found in this little card, you can see. You can follow along in your notes, but on the back, you're going to see today's sermon is the first of three. Today's sermon is entitled, The Bible Defines Leadership. Next week's sermon is entitled, Messiah's Misfits. And then the final sermon in this series is entitled, Faithful Fathers. It's not a sermon about fatherhood, but you'll see exactly what we meet once we arrive at that sermon itself. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 and verses 1 through 6, the apostle Paul here is speaking to the church at Corinth, and he says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of the darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart, then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Let us pray. Father, this morning as we enter your word, I pray that you would give us insight and clarity. I pray that we'd be able to speak the words of Christ here, that we would be able to explain the truths of the Holy Spirit through your word. And I pray that even in this moment, you would empty this place of selfish ambition, of evil spirit, of misunderstanding of your word, And you would help me to rightly divide the word of truth so that I can explain to your people your message. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. (coughs) Three myths of modern leadership. When we arrive in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the apostle Paul is attempting to clarify to the Corinthians what leadership is really all about. You see, in chapters 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul was telling this church at Corinth that they need to be unified and to stop dividing over the different leaders that God has brought them, Apollos, Paul, Peter, Jesus. And he said, you need to be unified. But by the time you get to chapter 4 and verse 1, the church is confused as to what a leader is supposed to be. Because just as in our day, so it was in their day, the concept of leadership was completely misunderstood. I think it's true that so often in our lives, we assume that we know what a leader is supposed to be. A leader is one who is fearless. A leader is one who never makes mistakes. A leader was one who always looks the part. He is self-reliant. She understands that life is all about her. That's what a true leader is. 
And if you're not careful in our modern society, even in the United States today, what you're going to be presented is a false understanding of what a true leader is. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4 redefines for the modern mind what leadership actually is. And you're going to see from the Word of God, from this chapter, that leadership is all about faithfulness. Next week, we're going to see that leadership is all about humility. And then the week after that, we're going to see that leadership is all about tenderness. This is what the Word of God says. The first myth that we're going to uncover today from the Scripture is this concept that a leader will be universally loved and always successful. I can remember my first job. Can you remember your first job? Do you remember where you first were hired? What was your first job? Somebody raised their hand and tell me. My first job was fill in the blank. What was your first job? Oh, at the New York, New York. What did you do at New York, New York? Oh, you worked at the arcade. That is a great job for a 16-year-old. How many of you, that's a better job than you had at 16? How many of you are like that, me? Man, working in an arcade, 16 years old. Very cool. I like that. Somebody else, what was your first job? Yes. Uh, delivered newspapers for the Boston Globe at 10 years old. Delivered newspapers for the Boston Globe, helping uncover all the crimes. I'm loving it. Very good. Yes. McDonald's. How many of you, your very first job was food service? Raise your hand. How many of you are like that? So was mine. My first job was actually in food service at a camp that I worked at. I was 16 years old as well, 15 actually, almost 16. And I got hired to work at this camp, and I was very excited about it. And they assigned me to be the very important position of dishwasher. And the way it worked was this. I stood in a room, and all of the different campers would come by. They would give me their dirty dishes. I would take stacks of dirty dishes, and I would place them in trays. How many of you ever dealt with these trays before? Then you pull the tray inside of a dishwasher. You close the door, and that, that, that thing would just spin. And then about 90 seconds later, they would all come out clean if I did my job correctly. And I got to tell you, that first day, I was excited about my job. And that second day, I was not excited about my job. And that third day, I hated my job. It was just one tray after another and after another and after another. And I began to notice that mine was not the only job at that camp. There were other people. There were cooks right there in the kitchen. And there were cleaners right there in the kitchen. And there were people that were out in the dining hall that served people right there in the kitchen. And then there were people outside. There were cowboys who worked at that camp, worked with the horses. And there were other people who worked with the, with the activities. There were people who led in all sorts of ways throughout the entire camp. And I began to notice my job was not the only job, but I became an expert at everybody else's job. <laughs> Have you ever worked with somebody who was an expert at your job and loved to talk with you about it? I learned, and I'll come back to this later, that if I was going to succeed, I needed to be faithful at the job I was given and not pretend to be an expert at everybody else's job. Faithfulness is a quality that's not really mentioned in our modern society. Faithfulness is not a quality that often we look at and say, that's what I need to be and that's what I need to hire. But faithfulness is the first of the three qualities the Apostle Paul brings out in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says a biblical leader is a faithful leader. And a faithful leader, according to verses 1 through 3, is a leader who is living for the audience of one. Can I ask you as I begin this morning? Are you faithfully doing what God has called you to do? Hey, listen to me. Every man and woman and teenager in this room, God has created you uniquely and has gifted you specifically to do something in this world that only you have been called to do. Are you faithfully doing what God has called you and created you to do? As a father or as a mother, are you faithful in that calling? 
Whatever it is, the occupation you call your job, are you faithful to accomplish that God's calling in your life? Your position in the community, your ministry that God has called you to, are you faithful in accomplishing what God has called you to do? Because we see, number one, that a faithful leader is, number one, living for an audience of one. Where do I get this? Look at verses one through three. It says, now let a man so consider us. The apostle Paul says, okay, before we go any further in our study, I want you to look at us as an example. We, your leaders. He's talking now about himself, Paul, and Apollos, another preacher, and Peter, another preacher. And he says, I want you to consider us as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. He says, I want you to realize that we are two things. First of all, we are servants of Christ. The word servant there is interesting. It's a very specific word in the original languages. It means under rower, specifically an under rower in the time of the Roman Empire was a galley slave. This is the word he was referring to. Paul said, when you look at me, your leader, when you look at me, your spiritual authority, when you look at me, your preacher, just understand who you're looking at. I'm not some great person. All I am is a galley slave that is told what to do by the master. I just keep rowing and rowing and rowing. That's all I am. This is going to highlight, this moment actually is foreshadowing where the Apostle Paul is going to go in the middle of the chapter. He's going to talk about the fact that every leader ought to be a humble man. Every leader ought to be a humble woman. But he goes on as a galley slave for Christ. He says, I'm also a steward of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God was revealed in chapter 3. If you remember, the mystery of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he said, I'm a steward of that. It means he doesn't own it, but he holds it for another. That's what a steward is. A steward is not somebody who owns something. In fact, a steward owns nothing. A steward is one who manages something for someone else. Listen, did you know as a Christian, every single one of us are called to be stewards of God? We don't own what we have. What we do is we merely manage what God owns because we are bought by Christ. But it goes on, let a man consider us as stewards and as, or as servants and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, here's his point, he's going to make his point in verse 2, it is required that stewards, that one be found faithful. Say the word faithful. faithful. Say it again, faithful. faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. This is a very interesting phrase, and I think one that is going to really resonate with this modern audience. He said, I work for Jesus, and it's required by Jesus that I be found faithful to Jesus. And so it really doesn't matter much to me how you think or judge me. That's what he says. See it? But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. He said, if I work for Christ and I work directly for him, then honestly, it doesn't matter to me what you think about me. Your opinion, if I work for him, is kind of irrelevant. What the apostle Paul is saying here is a message for every man in this room, every woman in this room, everyone who leads a child in a home, everyone who leads an employee or a coworker at work, anyone who leads in this community. Here it is, number one. Here it is. A faithful leader lives for the audience of the boss. Say, Pastor, I have a lot of bosses. I have uplines, and I have managers, and I have corporate CEOs, and I've got people that I work for. Or if you're a small business owner, you say, I don't have any boss. Any small business owner understands if you feel that way, you'll have no job for long because as a small business owner, every single customer is your boss. And a lot of times we think to ourselves, well, I, I tell you this, I am absolutely answering to many, many people. I've got many bosses. And Paul says this, a faithful leader understands I've got one boss. I live for the audience of one. A steward is only concerned about what the master thinks. A steward is not really concerned about what other stewards think of his work. 
You know, one of the things that I find is most inhibiting to followers of Christ is that we are more concerned about what other followers of Christ think of us than we are with what Christ thinks of us. You have to get to the point where it doesn't bother you. You know this church, I'll use it as an example. When I say this church, I mean you and I, the people. Some of you are newer to this church, and you may be surprised by this, but this church is sometimes heavily criticized. Even I, as your pastor, criticize shocking. How could that be? I'm such a likable person. Do you know what I get, the most common criticism? You can look it up on Google, because people Google review churches. How weird is that? But if you want to give us five stars, we're cool. (laughs) If you look it up online, this is true. The number one criticism we get is the pastor tries to be too funny. And to that I say, I'm not trying. (laughs) It's who I am. (laughs) <laughs> I had a um, pastor contact me, I n- not even live in the state, some random pastor contacted me via Twitter, on Twitter. He tweeted, isn't that a weird thing to say? <laughs> a pastor tweeted. <laughs> he tweeted at me and he said, he said, Josh Tice, uh, follow me so I can talk to you about something. So I did, I followed him. I said, what's up, man? I thought you needed help or something. And he said, uh, dear Brother Tice, that's how the tweet began. I thought, oh, no, not one of these guys. He said, dear Brother Tice, I'm very concerned. I was looking through those, your follower list, and I noticed that you follow Jimmy Fallon. A man of God should not follow such wicked people. And I replied, who is this? <laughs> I thought somebody, I thought one of the church members made a fake account and they're messing with me, you know? I'm like, come on, who is this really? Come on, who is this? Brother Tyus, I'm very concerned. You're a man of God and you follow Jimmy Fallon. Why? Why? (laughs) Pastor Josh. And I'm like, I don't know, he's funny. (laughs) I'm like, what he does, you know? (laughs) Golly. It's incredible to me, sharp criticism. If you've lived any amount of time and have done anything in your life, you're going to have people criticize you. You have family members criticize you? You have people you work with criticize you? You have friends criticize you? You have people that used to know you before you came to Jesus and they're like, oh, you're so holy now, criticize you? You have religious people of your past (coughs) look at you and criticize you? Do you have people come to you and say, how dare you do this? You're not alone, so do I. I've had people tell me I'm a bigot. Literally, you're a bigot because you won't perform same-sex marriages. I've had people tell me I'm a patriarchal misogynist because I'm pro-life. I've had people tell me I'm a closeted sodomite for apparently having weak wrists. This is true. People have said these things. I've had people tell me I'm a secret socialist because I don't publicly endorse Donald Trump. People have said of our church, people, it's true. You know me, too. (laughs) This is all true, every one of these. People have said, your music is too loud, your dress is too casual, your Bible is too modern, your smile and personality are too captivating. That one never happened. That's not true. (laughs) But I believe believe it's a a genuine criticism. (laughs) I think it's true. I've come to the point in my life where, as the Apostle Paul, is that if I'm pleasing to God... Your opinion is irrelevant. I don't have to please the fellow workers in the field when I serve one master. This is freeing for us Christians, you see? It's freeing. I met a man who once, I met a man, I've done this several times, but I can remember one specifically, a man who was suffering under a terrible condition paralysis of analysis. What if I fail? What will they think of me? What will happen? What will this? What will that? What if? 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 What if something? 
What if nothing? Listen to me. Paul said this, I am simple. I'm a very simple person. I'm a servant of Jesus, and I'm a steward of the gospel, and what you think about me matters very little to me, and even what a human court might condemn me of matters very little to me. I serve one. There's a really good feeling about that. I know it's true for pastors, we struggle with this, but I also think it's absolutely true for every Christian in this room and every Christian throughout the kingdom. We need to live for the audience of one. Number one, a faithful leader is one who living for the audience of one. Number two, a faithful leader is one living for the day of judgment. Say day of judgment. Say it. Day of judgment. Ooh. People are really nervous about the day of judgment. Ooh. Well, the reason you might be nervous about the day of judgment is because as a human, you, in ne- you, you instinctively know that one day you're going to stand before God as a judge. In fact, Jesus actually told us this. Jesus said part of the Holy Spirit's job is to convict men that one day they will stand before a righteous God. So I don't know who you are or where you come from. I guarantee I know something about you. Here's one thing I know about you. Instinctively, deep down, one day you know you're going to stand before God and answer for your life. You know it. You say, I don't believe it. It's because you spent years of your life suppressing that inward knowledge. But deep down, you know you will. And so do I. I know you will because the Bible says you will. You're going to stand before God. Now, for some of us, that day is going to be awesome. There are going to be those who stand before God, and it's, it's going to be a good day. Do you know why? Here's why. Because they have been redeemed by Jesus Christ. They've been saved, and they're going to spend their life serving him in his field as a steward and as a servant. There will be others, though, who have rejected Jesus Christ, and they're going to stand at a different judgment called the great white throne judgment, and they will be damned for their sin and unbelief, and they will be sent to hell. It's a stark reality, but it is the truth. It doesn't matter as an ostrich if you put your head in the sand. It doesn't change the fact that it will happen. So we see that a faithful leader is one who is living not only for an audience of one, they're living for the judgment day. They're living for the day that is to come. They're living for this moment. And it's absolutely okay to do so. Let me say it this way. There's only one performance review that really matters. We recently had performance reviews here at the church. How weird is that? that churches do performance reviews with their pastors. I did one myself. You say, who reviewed you? It's called a 360 review. It's a peer review. It means other people anonymously speak into your work. And one of our deacons, um, who is a sadist, uh, gave us this uh, wonderful (laughs) opportunity. And at the end of this peer review, what happens is you sit down with one of the other pastors, and they walk you through Uh, what other pastors have anonymously stated, and they did all these charts and graphs, and they talk about your five great strengths and your five great weaknesses. Today, I would like to share with you my five great strengths (laughs) and weaknesses. No, this is really my peer review from, uh, from 2019. My top five strengths. Number one, Josh is open to change and innovation. Absolutely. Number two, Josh is committed to achieving goals. Yes. Number three, Josh knows the vision, mission, goals of the company. Well, I guess that's probably true. Yes. Uh, This is made, obviously, for a secular realm, but we know the vision, mission, and goals of the church because I lead and we started this church. Is focused on the needs of the customer uh, or church member. Uh, Takes initiative to solve problems. These are my five strengths according to this peer review. Number number two, let's go ahead and look at my top. How many have already read the weaknesses? You already skipped ahead because you want to know, that's messed up, DC. That's that's not nice, but I'm going to tell you. Here are my weaknesses. List. Uh, or list is the wrong word there, handles conflict in an appropriate manner. This is true. When conflict arises, I get really weird. How many of you are like me? Whenever conflict happens, you're like, I think I'm going to leave now. I'm not a conflict type of a person. I like to walk away, so I have to get better at that. Is focused on the needs of others. Uh, That is also true. That is a weakness of mine. I don't care Um, I said that in the first point. I don't care if you like me, and I I, I have a struggle whether or not um, I take care of others. Isn't that terrible? I'm so embarrassed. Controls emotions and behavior in high-pressure situations. (laughs) 
on more than one occasion, I've lost my cool in multiple ways. Sometimes it comes out in anger. Sometimes it comes out overly emotional. Um, how many of you understand in business meetings you're not supposed to cry? <laughs> I have cried on multiple occasions. It's not even a joke. I start shaking. I get really nervous. I start shaking. It's not true of you. You're strong. I've st I shake. This is a weakness. I'm working on it. Number four, is approachable and willing to listen. It's one of my weaknesses. I appear to be approachable and willing to listen. It's an appearance. It's fake. And you come and talk to me, and I was like, yeah, that's great. That's great. And then I'll go, I'll do what I want, right? <laughs> Seeks out feedback. I don't need your feedback. Why? Because I live for an audience of one. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is my a uh, performance review of 2019, and I thought you should know. You know what I've learned? There are going to be a lot of performance reviews. And, and the reality is there are a lot of things we can learn from those to improve. We need to grow and improve with the people that we work with. But there is a performance review that is coming, and it is the last one. It's called Judgment Day. And when we stand before God, he's going to want to know very simply, what did you do with the life that I gave you? Look at verses three and four. The apostle Paul says, it really doesn't matter to me what you think or any court thinks, verse three. In fact, I do not even judge myself. He basically says, I don't care what others think. I don't care what, what, uh, what the court says. And I don't even consider, I don't even care that much what I think about me. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? Because we so often condemn our own selves. Man, what's wrong with me? What did I do? He says, my opinion of me doesn't even matter. It's only, my, it's only Christ's opinion. I don't even trust my own judgment is what he's saying here. It's hard for me to know if I've really been faithful. There's no way for me to actually know this. There's no way for you to know if you've been good enough to please your master. That's what he's saying. So verse four, he says, for I know nothing against myself. He says, now my conscience is clear. When I do try to judge myself, I don't think of anything that's wrong, yet I am not justified by this. Just because I can't, just because I can't think of anything that I've done wrong doesn't mean I haven't done anything wrong. It's confusing, right? But he who judges me is the Lord. His point at the end was, it doesn't matter what you think, it doesn't matter what they think, it doesn't even matter what I think. All that matters is one day, God, I will stand before him and he will judge me. Here it is again. When you stand before God, will he be pleased with what you did, with what you were given? You say, but I'm pleased. It doesn't matter. If you're pleased, you could deceive yourself. Others are pleased. Great. Spend your entire life pleasing others and see how far that gets you. It's really hard to please everybody. The question that remains for every human soul is the one who created me. When I stand before him, will he be pleased? I had a man call me in the early days of our church. We just started a choir. Pastor Jason and Kimberly had just arrived and we started a choir. He called the church offices and I, it used to just be my, my, myself and Fred and Jason and picked up the phone. I'm like, hey, Southern Hills Baptist Church, hello. This is Pastor Josh. How can I assist you and direct your call? I'm the only one here. <laughs> well, I just want to talk with you about Sunday service. I said, oh, okay. He said, I have some, uh, some, uh, some critiques if you're interested. Absolutely. I, <laughs> I would love, I'd love to take note of these. God bless you. And he began to talk to me about this and that and the other thing. And one thing I remember him bringing up was the choir. The choir just started. He was very upset. You remember this? You remember this story? He was very upset because he noticed that Pastor Jason was singing along with the choir, which a choir director is not supposed to do. When in reality, Jason was just mouthing the words, not singing along. But he was convinced. And I remember getting really defensive and angry about it. I remember getting like, how did, who do you, what the, what, what, mm, her? and I, I began to mm, feel that mm, inside it, you know, that mm, have you ever felt mm, that, have you ever, mm. I remember on the phone, 
I felt as if the Holy Spirit just calmed my nerves and said, calm down. There's something that matters more here. So I said, man, I said, what you bring up is a really interesting point, and I'm really thankful for it. Is it possible that maybe we could get together over a cup of coffee and talk more about the choir? He said, I'd love to. I said, fantastic. I didn't want to do it. (laughs) But I knew what God has called me to do, so we went out there, sat down. I said, tell me everything you want to know about the choir. Tell me all the things that I can tell. For about 10 minutes, he let me know all of his ideas about the choir and these kind of things, wrote down notes. I wasn't making fun. I was literally trying to find out, learn. And then at the end, I said, is that all you have to say about the choir? He said, yeah. I said, that's great. I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, if you were to die today and stand before God, do you know for sure that God would let you into heaven or are you afraid that maybe you'll go to hell? And all of a sudden, his face just broke. He said, Pastor Josh, that's my greatest concern in life. I don't know that I'm a Christian. I don't know that I would go to heaven if I died. I said, oh. I said, could I tell you what the Bible says about how you can know for sure that when you died, you would go to heaven? He said, I would love that. And I went and I explained the gospel, that God loves him, and that Jesus Christ, God's son, came to earth and died for his sins, and that he was buried and that he rose again, and that he offers salvation to you if you'll freely receive it. There's nothing you can do to save yourself, I told him. All you can do is by God's free gift, believe on Jesus Christ and ask him to save you and you'll be saved. And right there over a cup of coffee, this man bowed his head and received Jesus Christ as his savior. And he was a member of our church for many, many years. He never liked our choir the whole time. (laughs) But he fell in love with Jesus. Let me ask you this question. Listen to me, listen to me. Are you sure that one day when you stand before God, God is going to open the gates of heaven to you? You Say, man, I hope so. I'm really trying to live my life in such a way. I'm really trying to do all the things I need to do in order to get to heaven. Here's the problem. There's nothing you can do to get into heaven. The only thing that can be done for you is that God himself die for your sins, is buried and rises from the grave. Here's the good news. He did it. So then heaven belongs to the person who repents of their sin and receives Jesus as Savior. Have you done that? Have you done that? If you've never done that, my friend, what what is it that's keeping you from doing that even right now? Today, call upon Christ. The faithful leader, according to this passage, number one, is a living... (coughs) (coughs) Mental note, don't shake hands with the pastor today. Faithful leader is living for an audience of one. Number two, a faithful leader leader is living for the day of judgment. And that's what Paul is saying. And number three, he says, a faithful leader, number three, is living with reasonable expectations. It is so difficult to live a life of reasonable expectations. How many of you have ever been disappointed at least once in your life? Raise your hand. How many have ever been disappointed by someone else in your life? Raise your hand. How many have ever been disappointed with yourself? Raise your hand. Sure, that's right. That's right. It's amazing, the unreasonable expectations. I I read this recently on Facebook, spiritual leaders today. Look at what, what is expected of the average pastor, spiritual leader. Let's see if that's up there. A spiritual leader or pastor today needs to be a dynamic communicator, a powerful visionary, a leadership guru, political commentator, a podcast creator, a marriage therapist, a social activist, a parenting expert, and a bedside chaplain. That is is the minimum requirement of every pastor. Do you know why pastors quit churches? Because that is an unreasonable expectation of one person. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I think it's pretty reasonable. All right, let's talk about your expectation. Here, let's go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. Here's a family man's expectation. Today, family men are are expected to be ruggedly handsome, brilliant philosophers, financial wizards, feminine perspective. That's right. Every man needs to understand the feminine perspective. 
We need to be deeply emotional. We need to be hopelessly romantic. We need to be protector and a provider. At the same time, defender of equality. We need to be a best friend to our wife as well as a girlfriend to our wife. <laughs> and if you as a man don't live up to those things, you disappoint everybody. You ready, ladies? Here's the modern Wonder Woman. She needs to be eternally youthful, successful career, breathtakingly beautiful at all times, always on time, aggressively sexual, incredible chef, strong, but not intimidating. <laughs> Strike that balance every day of your life. Always happy and an attentive mother. Got it. Got it. Check. <laughs> Done. One woman in the church. Wow. Wow. We're all impressed. She's a liar. <laughs> Somebody right now is doing a Google review. He thinks he's so funny. <laughs> Check out the modern businessman or community leader. Here's what they need to be. Never afraid, never fail, always positive, can tell the future. Never frustrated, perfectly relatable, never disappoints, wealthy but not showy. Self-reliance, but also a team player. And oh my word, the leadership books are exhausting. And the magazines on the rack as I go by, I'm just trying to buy dinner. And they're telling me what a failure I am. A faithful leader is living with reasonable expectations. You say, what should I expect? Let's, let's conclude the sermon by telling you what you should expect. You should expect, number one, expect to be judged by the master, not others. Oh, you should be expecting to be judged by others. You just shouldn't care. Here's a reasonable expectation. Expect to be judged by the master. That will happen. We spend our lives expecting that others will judge us and forgetting that he's gonna judge us. We should spend our lives caring less that they're judging us, knowing he will judge us. Verse five, therefore judge nothing before the time. The apostle Paul says, if you're thinking about Apollos and myself and Peter, stop judging us. One day there will be a time where we are judged by the father, by the, by the master, by the judge, until the Lord comes at judgment day, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the heart. Notice this, it actually tells us what the judgment will be like. He's gonna judge you for the things you did and why you did them. Your actions will be judged as well as your motives will be judged. Then each one's, then it says, each one's praise will come from God. Notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, when God the master judges you, each one's judgment will come from God. If you are a follower of Christ and you're at the great, if you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you're not looking for judgment, you're looking for praise. You will be praised by Christ. You say, what about all my sins? Oh, friend, all of your sins were already judged on the cross if you've been saved. Now it's about your service. And he's not gonna focus on the mistakes. He's gonna say, hey, you did well here and your motive was right here and I know everybody thought you did wrong here but I noticed you did the right thing there. Your praise will come from him. In that moment, it won't matter what your enemies thought of you. In that moment, it won't matter what your friends thought of you. Spend your life trying to please your enemies or please your friends. In that moment, it won't matter. See, leaders today spend so much time focused. Does everybody love me? It doesn't matter if you're not pleasing Christ with your life. Does it make sense? Because in that moment, it won't matter. they won't be around. What should I expect? Here are the reasonable expectations. Expect to be judged by the master. Expect to be judged on the base, basis of faithfulness. Faithfulness is the key. Faithfulness. Look at verse six. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes. That is, he said, I've been talking about Apollos and myself as an example. As an example. That you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. What, what, what is he talking about? He's pointing back to the previous chapters that Paul planted, Apollos watered, 
and God gave the increase. What he's saying here is this. The reasonable expectation that you ought live under is to be faithful to the job you've been given. Think of the world like a giant assembly line and God is the master who gives you a job. Do your job. Let me ask you a question. Are you as a Christian faithfully doing and executing what God has called you to do as a parent, as a spouse, as an occupation, as a ministry leader, in your ministry, in your community? Here's what we do. We spend our lives focused on that which God never called us to do, focused on the job of the person beside us or the job of the person down the row or the job of the person in the other building instead of focusing on what God has called us to do. Expect God to receive all the glory. Look what it ends in verse six. That none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. That is, you'll stop celebrating one leader above another leader. Why? <coughs> because it doesn't matter. All that matters, listen, all that matters is if God has called Paul to do the planting, Apollos to do the watering, it's God who receives all the glory in the end. So you just have to be faithful to do what you're supposed to do. So I was a dishwasher. And as a dishwasher, I watched as the people who made coffee made coffee. And they did it wrong. And as the cowboys who led all the children on the cowboy rides, how they could do it better. And how those who structured the service times and the game times, how they could have, in fact, this is an actual truth. At 15 years old, I set an appointment for the director of the camp, my boss's boss's boss. Because I had made notes on everybody else's job and how they could do it better. Have you ever worked with somebody like me before? Isn't that terrible? <laughs> I remember sitting down. His name was Bill, Dr. Rice. I remember sitting down with him, and we went out by ourselves to a Carl's Jr., and he sat down. He bought me a hamburger, fries, and a Coke. And this dear man, who is a very successful leader in his 50s, he sat down with a 15-year-old to hear my concerns about his organization. A dishwasher. And he said, Josh, I heard you have some notes on how we could run camp better. I said, absolutely, sir, I sure do. And I began to walk through how this needs to be improved and that needs to be improved and the other thing needs to be improved. A hand of God. For 20 to 30 minutes, he just let me go on and on and on. And in the end, he, I saw him. He's sitting there taking notes, taking notes. He closed it off, put it to the side, and he said to me, he said, Josh, I really appreciate you bringing these to me. He said, let me ask you a question. How's it going in the dish room? I said, well, I mean, it's good, it's fine, it's great. He said, what can we do to improve the dish room? I said, well, I could take a few notes on that if you'd like. He said, you know, that would really help me. <laughs> he, never, he never tried to make me feel stupid. I, I realized later what he was doing. He was saying, how about if you focus on your job and everybody else focuses on their job, then maybe the camp will run the way I've designed it to run. Hopefully, in the last 25 years, I've grown in a little bit of wisdom. And I'm focusing on being faithful to my job. How about you? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God that this confusion that was taking place in the church at Corinth is really the confusion that's happening in our society today. That we have a responsibility to faithfully do what we've been called to do. <laughs> and I pray that you'd bless us and help us to do just that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. If God has used this message to impact your life, we would love to hear from you. Please send an email to connectdesk at southernhillslv.com. If you would like to support this ministry financially, you can do so at southernhillslv.com slash give. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this church in Las Vegas to reach God's people around the world. 